Oh, hey friends, welcome to Advent 2021. Now, I love every season and every Sunday here at Grace, but there is something special about these four Sundays leading up to Christmas Eve and the celebration of Christ's birth. I look forward to it every year, and I am so glad you're with us today as we begin this journey. When our team first sat down to choose our theme for this year, back in July, uh, we thought through the traditional themes of Christmas, peace, hope, joy, but we pretty quickly found our way to love. Now, after all the distance and isolation we've lived with this past nearly two years now, and, and after hardly being able to gather at all last Christmas, we felt as though we're all longing for, for love this Christmas. Not, not, not just love in the abstract, but the actual experience of being loved. And that word with a D on it is a declaration. It's a statement of fact. You are loved. We are loved. And who doesn't want that? But, but what does it mean to be loved? How do we know we're loved? What difference does it make in our lives, in the world, if we're loved? Well, Christmas answers those questions in the most beautiful and powerful way. So each week, as we make our way through the season, we'll be discovering what it means to be loved and why it matters so much right now. Well, as I said, the journey begins today, but there are a few highlights along the way that we don't want you to miss. On the weekend of December 10 and 11, each of our campuses will be hosting a Christmas with Grace event an in-person, interactive experience of light, music, and, and, and fun for all ages. So check the website for details and for the campus near you. On Sunday, December 19th, we'll be, pre be presenting a dramatic Christmas monologue, which every year brings to life one of the biblical characters from the Christmas story. It's a great Sunday to invite a friend to join you. On Christmas Eve, our services will be both online and in-person beginning with Christmas Eve Eve on December 23rd. Again, you can check the website for details. And then on Sunday, December 26th, we'll have a one church virtual Christmas service, online only. Our physical campus will be quiet that day as we come together to celebrate as one church. So if you happen to be traveling that weekend, you can join us from wherever you are. And if you have family or friends visiting with you, they can join you for church that day. So you can find all the info you need for everything Christmas, including our own Spotify Christmas playlist at grace.org slash Christmas. So it's going to be a great season. And Pastor Ruthie is going to get us started today by reminding us that Christmas means we are seen. Now each week, our message will be introduced with a fresh look at some familiar Christmas texts and characters. Now, if you happen to be new to us, we are glad you found us in time for the Christmas season. So please, let us know you're here by texting hello to the number there on the screen. We'd love to send you a gift card for a Christmas coffee on us. Let's pray as we get started. Lord, thank you for this special season of the year. Thanks for songs to sing and stories to tell and for the opportunity to do it together. We ask you to meet us, Lord, personally today, wherever we might be, physically or spiritually, and ask for a fresh understanding and experience of what it means to be loved. In Jesus' name, amen. Come, are you weary? Come, are you thirsty? Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come, all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so His one and only Son to save a 
There once was a couple who wanted a child, but they were old, and the years when such things might come to be had passed them by. Elizabeth and Zechariah had lived well and loved God and one another, but they had never seen their hope come true. Until the day that hope saw them. Zechariah, a priest, was serving in the temple when an angel appeared before him. Don't be afraid, Zechariah, the angel said. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will have a son, and you will call him John. He will bring you joy, and he will prepare your people to receive their king. Zechariah returned home speechless, and a miracle took place. His wife, Elizabeth, finally conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus has my God done for me. He has seen me and took away my shame. From Luke 1, verse 5 through 25.
I love stories. I love listening to them and telling them and reading them, especially to children. Stories stick in our minds in a way few other genres do. I recently asked a group of children, what are some of their favorite stories or books to read or have their parents read to them over and over again? The answers ranged from The Diary of a Wimpy Kid and Pete the Cat to The Berenstain Bears and The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And whenever I ask that question, a bunch of my own favorites flood my mind. Books I loved reading to our girls and now I read to my grandkids. Have you found that the ones you read the most, without even trying, you have parts of them memorized? I'll show you. I'll start with a line and you try to finish it and then we'll identify the book. In the light of the moon, a little egg lay on a leaf. One Sunday morning, the warm sun came up and pop, out of the egg came a tiny and very hungry caterpillar. And the book is aptly called The Very Hungry Caterpillar by Eric Carle. Here's another one. In the great green room, there was a telephone and a red balloon and a picture of a cow jumping over the moon. That's from the classic Goodnight Moon by Margaret Wise Brown. Now this next one is a little bit longer, but it fits the season. It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. He puzzled and puzzled till his puzzler was sore. Then he thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened next? Well, in Whoville, they say, someone's small heart grew three sizes that day. Yes, How the Grinch Stole Christmas by Dr. Seuss. When we read stories over and over, they, they get inside of us. We remember the pattern of the sentences, the rhythm of the syntax, the words and the phrases. And the narratives of scripture, just like any good story, have a way of connecting with us on a deep and personal level. And there are certain stories we read over and over every year. It's part of what we call the church or the liturgical calendar. So, fun fact. Did you know that today is our New Year's Day? It's the first Sunday of Advent, the beginning of the church year. And from now through early June, the church will reread the Old Testament prophecies and the New Testament stories of Jesus' birth, life, passion, death, resurrection, ascension, and then the sending of the Holy Spirit, giving birth to the early church. We retell the stories, sometimes in sermons and teaching, like during Advent and Christmas and Easter, and sometimes in observances and experiences, like Ash Wednesday, Sacred Spaces, or Good Friday. On this first Sunday of Advent, we begin with the very first people who got word that God had seen the plight of the people he loved and was about to launch his plan to redeem them. Not Noah and the ark with God redeeming a family to start life over again. Not Moses at the burning bush with God redeeming his chosen people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. Not Jonah in the belly of the whale with God redeeming even the enemies of his people with good news of his compassion. But a little known couple living in a small village in the Judean hill country. There are no books named after them in the Bible like Jonah. No Cecil B. DeMille blockbuster movie made about them like Moses. No toys created about them like Noah and his ark. Just a faithful, ordinary priest and his wife. Elderly, childless, living a simple life in obscurity whom God considered righteous and blameless because of their observance of the commandments. While no one else paid much attention to them, God saw them. God loved them. And God chose to use them in the prelude to his plan 
to redeem not just a family or a certain group of people, but the world, Jew and Gentile, women and men, old and young. God's very own son, the long awaited for Messiah, the Lord was coming into the world to redeem the world. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Now, the writer of this gospel, Luke, was a physician. As such, he was educated and very much into the details. He gives us some important facts to frame our story. He gives us the time in history when Herod was king of Judea. Now, the scholars differ on whether this was Herod the Great, who ruled from 37 BC to 4 AD, or his son, Herod Antipas, who ruled in Judea from 4 to 39 AD. But whether it was Herod the Elder or the Younger, we have the time frame as the beginning of the first millennium of the Common Era. Luke then introduces us to the first two main characters and tells us a bit about each of them. Zechariah was a priest who belonged to the division of Abijah. Now a little background here. God had established the order of the priests when Moses was leading the Israelites from Egypt to the land of promise. The priests were to come from the descendants of Levi, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Aaron and his brother Moses were both descendants of Levi, and God had Moses anoint Aaron as the first high priest. From that time forward, the priests would be chosen from the descendants of Aaron, though still referred to as Levites. Now, by the time of King David, the number of Levites had grown very large. So before David's death, he created four different tasks and split the Levites into those four groups to lead these tasks. The first group were the priests, both high priests and ordinary priests, who served as temple leaders. And then there were judges, musicians, and gatekeepers. The group of priests and temple leaders were then divided into 24 divisions who would each serve in the temple for two weeks out of the year. Abijah was eighth in this order of divisions of priests. So Luke tells us that Zechariah belonged to this division of Abijah. So in his first part of verse 5, Luke is both confirming Zechariah's place in history as well as validating his lineage as an Israelite. Not only back to Abijah, but through him to Aaron, through Aaron to Levi, a son of Jacob, whose name you may recall had been changed to Israel. And then Luke mentions Elizabeth. He doesn't give us much information about her yet, but by naming her as the wife of Zechariah, he places her in the same historical period and affirms her lineage as well by noting she too descended from Aaron. And as is always the case in scripture, just having a woman's name mentioned is significant in a culture that was known for its patriarchal dominance. Luke goes on to tell us about their relationship with God and their family or lack thereof. He points out that Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in the sight of God. To live a life of righteousness was to live a life marked by holy and upright living. God's own character is the definition and source of righteousness. So being created in the image of God, we've been created with the ability to choose to live rightly. In the context of relationships, righteous living is characterized by action that promotes the peace and the well-being of others. This is the kind of life for which Zechariah and Elizabeth were known. This is what God has seen. He's noticed how they've lived their lives, how they've observed his commands and decrees. Not sinlessly, no one can do that, but blamelessly. And he's filled with love for them. Now you might wonder, how do we know God loved them? And actually it's a good question. In fact, if we read each of the gospel accounts of the birth of Jesus, the word love is never found. But the signs of his love are woven throughout the stories. And that's what we're going to be exploring in this series. Each week, we will discover another aspect of what it means to be loved. 
So how did Zechariah and Elizabeth know God loved them? Because he promised their ancestors he would. In Deuteronomy 7, we read this. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were numerous than the other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept his oath. He swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh and from the king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Zechariah and Elizabeth were part of that covenant of love. They loved because God first loved them. And in their observance of the commands of God, probably beginning with love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, what the Hebrews call the Shema, they have demonstrated their love for God through their years of faithful service. And yet even so, their life together was not everything they had hoped for. Notice Dr. Luke had one more fact to share with us about this faithful couple. They were childless. Elizabeth was unable to conceive something that stigmatized her in sight of all those around her. I wonder if in her barrenness, did Elizabeth wonder if God had forgotten her? Did she feel unnoticed by or disappointed in the one she had faithfully loved and served all her life? That can be a tough place to be, wondering if God really notices you. Does he really see what you're going through? Does he hear your prayers and know the longing in your heart? Have you ever felt forgotten or disappointed or unseen when your prayers went seemingly unanswered. Well, if we're honest, each of us has probably experienced that disappointment at least once in our lives. When my husband, John, accepted a position with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and began working with college students in upstate New York, I was invited to join the staff of a medium-sized Presbyterian church just outside of Troy. So while John was serving the students at RPI and other campuses throughout Eastern New York, I was discovering gifts for ministry within the local church. I had been hired to lead the Christian education ministry, but after a few years, the pastors with whom I worked saw more in me than I had. My friend Kate mentored me in leading worship. I remember the first time I was gonna give the benediction and I looked down the center aisle and there was Kate just outside the doors in the lobby. She had her arms like this, and she'd planted her feet. She knew I was nervous. She knew I didn't think I had the authority to pronounce a benediction. She was transferring her confidence in me. And then the senior pastor, Harry, mentored me in preaching, studying texts with me, sharing files of illustrations, and giving me outlines to follow in crafting a message. I soon discovered that preaching was something I loved to terrify myself to do. These friends and mentors nurtured these gifts in me for six years. The church affirmed the gifts and validated my call to pursue ordination as a pastor. And then InterVarsity offered John a job at the national headquarters in Madison, Wisconsin. After months of sending out resumes and interviewing with churches, I was left with nothing except a part-time job taking orders at the Pleasant Company, the makers of American Girl Dolls. Now our daughters were thrilled, but I was struggling. Had I heard God wrong? Was the church mistaken in affirming my call to ministry? Had Harry and Kate wasted their time mentoring me? The Lord had clearly called John to take this new role, but I felt like God had forgotten about me. My soul literally ached for the opportunity to preach or teach. I found myself journaling about the times when God had been fully present in my life, and I mustered up the strength to choose to continue to hope and to trust him to bring something good from that disappointing season. Well, what Elizabeth and Zechariah were about to learn was that God had not forgotten them. 
nor their desire for a child. God was about to redeem the heartache of a long unanswered prayer. And Zechariah was first to discover that he was seen by God. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Now the priests took turns going into the temple to serve. And during their time on duty, they would cast lots to determine whose turn it was to enter the space where the altar stood and offer the sacrifice of burning incense as an act of worship. No priest would get this honor more than once in a lifetime, and some never did. Luke tells us that in that moment, Zechariah had been chosen. While he went into the temple for the burning of incense at the altar, everyone else stayed outside to worship. Zechariah was alone. No one could see what he was doing, but everyone would know if he was doing his job right when they smelled the aroma drifting upward to the Lord. But Luke tells us something unexpected happened. While Zechariah was alone, someone saw him in the privacy of the holy space. Listen now to how that happened. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, let's pause to notice a few things. Zechariah is clearly no longer alone. An angel has appeared and is standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Luke is again giving us some very specific details. In Exodus 30, we read God's instructions to Moses about constructing the first altar of incense. It was to be placed in front of the curtain that shielded the Ark of the Covenant. And God told Moses that Aaron was to go to this altar every morning to burn a fragrant incense to the Lord and every evening at twilight, the same thing. And that when he did, God would meet him there. This ritual of worship would be passed from priest to priest down through the generations. And God's promise remained to meet the priest at the altar of incense. This is the spot the angel is standing just in front of the curtain where the morning and evening fragrant incense is burned to demonstrate the love and worship of God's people. So here in this place, Zechariah has this unexpected visitor and was terrified. The angel starts with, don't be afraid, Zechariah. <laughs> Poor angels. They always seem to have to say that first. There must be something startling about the sudden appearance of a heavenly being in a spot where you're used to being alone that strikes fear in your heart. Angel called Zechariah by name. Not only was he being visited by this celestial being, but the angel knew his name. He knew who he was. And not only him, but his wife Elizabeth. And the substance of a lifelong prayer to have a child. Zechariah was told that God had heard that prayer and was prepared to fulfill it. And the child will grow to be someone who would serve the Lord in a manner similar to Samson and Samuel from ages past. He would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, up until now, the Holy Spirit came upon individuals temporarily for a specific task. But it seems here the angel is indicating this child would be filled with the Spirit for his life, even before he's born. And then there are the things the angel says this child will do. Zechariah had to have recognized the references to the words of the prophets, specifically Malachi, the final prophet to ever receive and record a word from the Lord. Think about this for a moment. God had been silent since these last words 
of the Old Testament scriptures were written. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. So fast forward some 600 years, and Zechariah is standing in that sacred space, hearing some of those very words being spoken about a son he could not imagine being able to have, the son who would also fulfill the words of the great prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling, in the wilderness prepare a way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. It must have been too much to comprehend. Luke goes on to tell us of Zechariah's response. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. At first glance, that seems like a reasonable question. Zechariah is old. His wife Elizabeth is old. They are well past child-rearing, let alone child-bearing years. But notice, Zechariah doesn't ask, how will this happen? He asks, how can I be sure? He's not just doubting the physical possibility of fathering a child. He's questioning the validity of the message and the authority of the messenger. Now, before we jump all over Zechariah for his impertinence to question the angel, Let's look at the situation for a moment. He's known all his life he would serve the Lord as a priest. He was born into it. It was, in essence, the family business. He married Elizabeth and probably had hopes and dreams of serving God in the temple and raising a family with her. But the hopes had faded for a family. His wife's countenance almost always under a shadow of shame, disappointment, disgrace. He continued to serve the people, to offer prayers on their behalf, all the while his own prayer going unanswered. Now, in his old age, this strange visitor gives him news that's impossible to believe, because for all intents and purposes, what the angel was saying was impossible. However, the angel quickly responds. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Wouldn't you love to have been a fly on the wall at that moment? In my imagination, I see Gabriel kind of puffing himself up in this moment. He wants Zechariah to know just who he is. He claims his authority to speak by the fact that he stands in the presence of God and has been sent by God specifically to Zechariah to deliver this news. Remember, where is Zechariah in this moment? He's in the sacred space in the temple next to the altar of incense where God has promised to meet Aaron and his descendants. If there were ever a space where God might speak to someone, it would be here. Had Zechariah forgotten God's promise to meet the priests here in this space? Did he not realize that in serving the Lord, he also, in a sense, stood in the presence of God? Or after all these years, did he think since he was just an ordinary priest doing his job, that he remained unnoticed and unseen? Had the rituals and traditions of their worship become too routine? Perhaps this news from Gabriel felt like too little, too late. Well, whatever's going on in Zechariah's mind and heart, it does not diminish what is about to happen. This heavenly messenger has been sent by the God who saw Zechariah. And now Zechariah is about to get some tough love. He's being silenced for his lack of belief that he could trust this news. Let's look at what happened next. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. and They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. 
After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord had stunned this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. And now it's Elizabeth's turn to realize God's eye is on her. She has not gone unnoticed. His love and blessing are poured out on her as she welcomes Zechariah home. Elizabeth marvels as her husband tries to communicate what happened in the privacy of the temple by the altar of incense, where the messenger of God was present. The news that God has not only heard their prayer but was about to answer it confirms in Elizabeth's heart that God has kept his promise to love his people, to love her. She had not been forgotten. Elizabeth said, God has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Another way to translate that is, God has seen me. When Elizabeth realized God had seen her, she was filled with love and hope and wonder and joy. We know we are loved when we are truly seen by the one who first loved us. For five months, Elizabeth kept this miraculous secret. And then in her sixth month, she got a special visitor. And while that's a story for another day, one key moment demonstrates the truth of the message of Gabriel to Zechariah. The child in the womb of Elizabeth leapt when in the presence of the coming king. The Holy Spirit was indeed with this child even before he was born. Elizabeth spoke a blessing over Mary, a blessing that may, in a sense, be a bit of a confession on her own part. And as I think about it, mine as well. Elizabeth cries out, Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Well, one of the days when I was at work taking orders for American Girl Dolls, I met the supervisor whose desk was close to my station. Her name was Sue. We got to talking and it turned out she was a member of a Presbyterian church in town looking for a Christian educator. Out of the five Presbyterian churches in Madison, this church was the only one I had not applied to. And it was a mile and a half from our house. So the long story short is that church took me under care and launched me on a trajectory that would lead to my ordination as a pastor. And it was in this church that I fell more deeply in love with student and children's ministries, thanks to some of the most amazing young people I've had the joy to serve. I was also given multiple opportunities to preach and teach and lead worship. The Lord did not just fulfill his promise to call me as a pastor, the Lord went above and beyond that to set us on a path that eventually led us back to live in New England after 33 years away, to live within 30 minutes of our two grown daughters and here to grace. Even after six and a half years, I still marvel at the grace of this blessing, above and beyond all I could have asked for or thought. Well, soon after Mary returned home, Elizabeth gave birth to her son, and Zechariah's tongue was loosed when he confirmed the boy was to be named John. Immediately filled with the Holy Spirit, he launched into a song of praise. The priest became a prophet, speaking words of hope and fulfillment of God's plan to redeem his people. Zechariah was no longer just going through the motions. Ancient words of prophecy about to be fulfilled flooded from his transformed heart. God noticed Zechariah. He had not forgotten Elizabeth. Zechariah and Elizabeth were filled with renewed hope for God's love was about to break through into the world. They knew they were loved because they had been truly seen by the one they had loved and served all their days, the one who had first loved them. Can you imagine the stories they would tell young John? Friends, when you feel forgotten, unseen, disappointed, unnoticed, remind yourself of this good news. 
Commit it to memory so you can pull it out anytime you need it. We know we are loved when we are seen by the one who first loved us. May this be one of those stories that gets inside you. It's rhythm buoying your steps and it's words bringing joy and wonder to your heart. You are seen. You are noticed. You are not forgotten. You are loved. Thanks be to God. Amen. the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son, to make a wretch His treasure, how great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face away, Wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory great story. A couple of people who feel forgotten and overlooked, suddenly discovering they were seen 
and heard and loved. It changed the course of their lives and their community and ultimately changed the course of human history as their son John prepared the way for Jesus. And isn't it interesting that the word love never appears in any of the accounts of, of Jesus' birth? And yet it's, it's the unspoken message at the very heart of the Christmas story. It's the message we in our world need to hear this year. We know we are loved when we are seen by the one who loved us first. And if you're feeling seen right now in a good way, maybe for the first time or the first time in a while, and you'd like to know more about what it means to be loved by God, please reach out to me, Brian with a Y at grace.org. Well, we hope you'll be back with us next week because as, as wonderful as it is to be seen, there's something even more wonderful than that. And that's what I'll be talking about next week. But until then, grace and love be with you.